Stoichiometry of Gaseous Substances, Mixtures, and Reactions. To calculate the density of a gas, we need to know the molar mass of the gas and its molar volume. So remember the density is mass over volume. When we're calculating the density of liquids or solids, we usually use units of grams per milliliter, the mass in grams and the volume in milliliters. When we're talking about the density of a gas, because gases are so much less dense, we usually talk about grams per liter. So um, to calculate the density of, of a gas, if I know the molar mass, which is grams per mole, and the molar volume, which is liters per mole, then I can divide the molar mass by the molar volume to calculate grams per liter, because moles over moles would cancel. Um, to generally, the way that we calculate the molar mass of a gas is that we can uh, calculate N by using other variables from the ideal gas law. So if we're not given N, which is a component of ideal gas law, remember it's PV equals NRT. So if I don't have N, then I can usually use P and V and T, the other components from the ideal gas law, so that I can solve for N, and then we can plug it into this equation for molar mass. So this PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law, is a really good one to memorize. And so if we are trying to solve molar mass and I need N, then I would need to plug in P and V and T. R is a constant, so I always know what R is. So if I always know what R is and I can plug in P and V and T, then I can solve for N and then I can also solve for the molar mass. So most um, of the gases that we encounter and most of the substances that we encounter every day are mixtures. And air is also a mixture, the air that we breathe every day. So the air um, is composed of nitrogen at 78%, oxygen at 21 percent and argon and carbon dioxide make up a very small amount a, a little bit less than one percent together so most of the air that we breathe is nitrogen and oxygen but most of it is uh, nitrogen so um, the reason that we have to say dry air in this example is because when we talk about the hum when we talk about humidity and moisture being a component of air that can also make up a, a fairly significant percentage depending on how humid it is. So when we're talking about mixtures of gases, um, it's important to realize that each gas provides its own pressure. So remember, pressure is when a gas hits the walls of a container, it leaves a force. So if I blow up a balloon with air from my lungs, then the air has nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and argon, and I can measure the pressure inside the balloon, um, then each of those gases is providing a different component of that pressure. So let's say that I blow up a balloon and the pressure inside the balloon is two atmospheres. Well, the gases inside that balloon are nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and argon. So how much of that two atmospheres is provided by the nitrogen? Well remember nitrogen is 78 percent of air so 78 percent of the two atmospheres in the balloon comes from nitrogen and 21 percent of the two atmospheres pressure in the balloon comes from oxygen and the other about 1% comes from argon and carbon dioxide. So when I have a mixture of gases, they all provide one pressure. I can only measure one pressure in that balloon, but each component, each gas, is providing a different p 
part of the sum of the total. This is called Dalton's law of partial pressures. So if I have a mixture of gases of A, B, and C, oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide, then that I can measure the total pressure, which is the two atmospheres in my balloon. The two atmospheres equals, let me make this the math easier, one atmosphere. Then 0.78 atmospheres is nitrogen, 0.21 atmospheres is oxygen, and 0 0.1, 0 0.01 atmosphere is carbon dioxide. So the total pressure is one atmosphere, but the pressure of each of the gases is less than one atmosphere because they're all contributing to that total. I can also solve the ideal gas law for each of those pressures. If I know the pressure of uh, nitrogen, which is 0.78 atmospheres, then I can calculate how many moles of nitrogen there are. I can calculate how many, if I know the pressure of oxygen, I can calculate how many moles of oxygen there are using the ideal gas law. So another time that we encounter mixtures of gases is when we're measuring um, a gas over water because water is uh, even if it's a liquid when we're doing our measurements there's generally some gas that has evaporated off the surface of the liquid so we have to talk about what's called the vapor pressure of water and so let's look at this picture here here is liquid water molecules liquid water molecules down below but inside this tube here some of the liquid water molecules have evaporated and they've turned into gaseous water molecules so above the surface of, of any sample of water, even a glass of water, or above the surface of any water, there's always some gas, some particles of water that are gases because they've evaporated from the surface of the water. So the vapor pressure of water is the pressure uh, that's exerted by these particles of water only. So you can imagine if you have a glass of water that's cold, then it's not evaporating very much because the particles are, you know, if it's near, if it's about ready to freeze, then those particles are barely moving at all. It's almost solid ice. If they're barely moving at all, then there's not going to be many particles that evaporate from cold water. So if there's not many particles that evaporate, then there's not many particles of gas and there's not much pressure that's provided by those particles. So cold water has low vapor pressure. But if I heat water up and those particles start moving faster and faster and faster and it evaporates more and more and more, then there will be more gas particles up here which will provide more pressure. So hot water has higher vapor pressure. So that's what we see here. When the temperature is low, the vapor pressure is low when the temperature is high, the vapor pressure is high. So the vapor pressure increases, the vapor pressure of water increases as the temperature increases because the amount of particles that are evaporating from the surface of water increases as the temperature increases because the particles go faster. So if I'm doing this experiment, I drop zinc metal in hydrochloric acid. What happens is the zinc gives electrons to hydrogen. That turns the hydrogen into gas. So then these are hydrogen gas molecules. So when I drop the zinc into the HCl, I make gas, I make hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas bubbles up through this tube and it's a gas and the pressure is, it's moving this way. It's diffusing into this tube and as it comes down here it's going to pass through the water and it moves into this tube and the hydrogen uh, gets bubbled through the water and it goes up into this collection flask over here so maybe i'm trying to measure the volume of the hydrogen gas produced and i could make some marks over here and i have some graduations And this says 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. 
and I can measure as I collect hydrogen gas, the water is going to get pushed down. The level of water gets pushed down as the gas accumulates. So if I can measure the volume of gas, and that's one way that I can measure how much hydrogen is being produced in this reaction. But as I do that, I also have to account for the fact that there's water in here. In this collection flask right here where I'm doing this reaction, it's not just hydrogen in there, it's water also. So anytime I'm collecting a gas over water, I'm all, I always have a mixture of gases. And whenever I have a mixture of gases, I have to think about Dalton's law. So Dalton's law just says if I have a mixture of gases, A, B, C, hydrogen, and water, because I'm collecting hydrogen over water, then the total pressure in that system is a component of both the hydrogen and the water. So if I'm trying to measure the hydrogen pressure, I can't forget about the water pressure because water is part of that system. When I'm collecting a gas over water, there's gonna be water with that gas. It's a mixture of gases. So I have to think about the partial pressure of water and the partial pressure of hydrogen. Um, we've looked at stoichiometry a couple of different times. Stoichiometry with grams to moles to moles to grams. And then we looked at stoichiometry again with liters. And we went from liters to moles with molarity when we're talking about the concentration of a solution. We can go from liters to moles to moles to liters when we're talking about stoichiometry of a solution. Well, when I'm talking about the stoichiometry of a gas, then I have four variables, pressure, volume, temperature, and moles. So when, whenever I'm talking about stoichiometry, I'm always trying to get to moles. So remember, we can go grams, oops, grams to moles of A to moles of B to grams of B. Or we can go from liters of A to moles of A to moles of B to liters of B. Or we can go from pressure, volume, temperature of A to moles of A to moles of B. So this, so we've already done, this was chapter um, three. This was chapter four. And so now in, cha oh, I guess this is chapter nine. In chapter nine, we're uh, going to talk about this new route, this new stoichiometry route, pressure, volume, and temperature. But otherwise, it's the same. Whenever we're talking about stoichiometry, I'm always trying to get to moles. And when I have moles of one substance, I can convert to moles of another substance by using the coefficients in a balanced chemical reaction. And once I have moles of that other substance, I can convert to grams or liters or whatever, wherever I need to go next. Stoichiometry is always about converting whatever I'm given into moles. So I can go from, like I said, grams to moles of A to moles of B to grams of B, or liters if I have the molarity of a solution, or if I have the pressure and volume and temperature of a gas, then I can use PVT and solve for N. So the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. There's four variables. One, two, three, four. Remember, R is a constant. I always know what R is. It's always the same. It's always a constant. So in this equation, there's four variables. In order to solve this equation, I have to have three of them, and I solve for the fourth. So whenever I'm using the ideal gas law, I either have P, V, and N, and I solve for T, or I have P, V, and T, and I solve for N, 
or I have V, N, and T, and I solve for P, and so on. I always have to have three of these variables in order to solve for the fourth. So if I have P and V and T, then what I really have is N. Because if I have P, V, T, then I just plug those three into the ideal gas law, and I can solve for N. So that's the approach when we're doing stoichiometry of gases, is I'm always trying to get to moles. Here I can use, when I have the mass of something and I want to get to moles, I can use the molar mass. When I have P, V, and T of something and I want to get to moles, I use the ideal gas law. When I have liters of A and I want to get to moles of A, I use the molarity So in any different stoichiometry problem, I'm always just trying to get to moles. And once I get to moles, then I can convert moles of one substance to moles of another substance using a balanced chemical reaction. How many grams of water form when 1.24 liters of gas at STP completely reacts with O2. Okay, so just like when we have any problem, um, any word problem, let's find the important information. I have 1.24 liters here, and this is asking how many grams. And now we have to recognize that even though it's not numbers, this is important information that really is numbers because remember STP is really telling me that T equals 0 degrees Celsius and P equals 1 atmosphere. So STP is standard temperature and pressure. So that really is numeric information, STP. So I have T equals 0 degrees C, P equals 1 atmosphere, and 1.24 liters. What is 1.24 liters? It's volume. 1.24 liters. So I have T and P and V. So if I use the ideal gas law, then I have I can also solve for n. So if I want to rearrange this equation and solve for n, then I should divide both sides by RT. That will cancel RT from this side. And then I get n equals PV over RT. P is one atmosphere. V is 1.24 liters. R is that gas constant, 0 0.082 liter atmosphere over mole K. So now, here I have T and I could put 0 degrees C because that's what STP is. But now that we're, um, I've put the ideal gas constant in, it's always important to look at my units and make sure that my units are going to cancel out right. So atmosphere is going to cancel with atmosphere. Liter will cancel with liter down here, one on top, one on bottom. Um, I don't have anything to cancel with mole, but that's good because N is moles, so I want to have units of moles when I'm done. But this K and degree C, those are not going to cancel. So whenever I use the gas constant, liter, atmosphere, 
mole Kelvin. My temperature must be in units of Kelvin. So zero degrees C equals 273K. So I should use units of Kelvin here instead. Because now my units will cancel. K cancels with K. So 273 and 0 are a lot different, first of all. And second of all, if I put 0 down here, what's going to happen to my math? 0 0.082 times 0 equals 0. 1.24 divided by 0 equals infinity. So it would be not my answer would be nonsense. So remember, we can't really multiply by zero or divide by zero, or my answer is going to be zero or infinity. Um, and so temperature almost always in these questions has to be in Kelvin and not in degrees C. So zero degrees C is equal to 273 Kelvin. But remember that our units have to cancel. And the units on the ideal gas constant never change. They always are liter atmosphere over mole K. So after we um, make sure that our units cancel, then I put these numbers in, 1.24 divided by 0 0.082 divided by 273 equals 0 0.0. 0, 5, 5, 3 moles of H2. So now the question's asking how many grams of water. So if I plug these numbers into the ideal gas law, then I can figure out how many moles of H2 I have. So now that I have moles of H2, I have to convert that into grams of water using stoichiometry. So moles of H2 on top means I have to put moles of H2 on the bottom. And I'm trying to get from moles of H2 to moles of H2. Oh, and according to my reaction up here, I have two moles of H2 for every two moles of H2O, so two for two. So I don't want to stop with moles of water. If I have moles of water on top, I need to put moles of water on the bottom, and I want grams of water. This is asking how many grams of water. So I can look at my periodic table and see that uh, I add up the molar mass of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom to get 18 grams for the molar mass of water in one mole. So before we plug this into the calculator, let's make sure that our units cancel out. So moles of H2, moles of H2, moles of H2O, moles of H2O, and I'm left with grams of H2O. All right, so 0 0.0553 times 2 divided by 2 times 18. 0 0.997 grams of water. So I have three sig figs here. I should have three sig figs here. So getting the moles of substance A is always the first part in a stoichiometry problem. And once I have moles of substance A, I convert them to moles of substance B, and then to grams of substance B, or liters of substance B, or whatever the question may ask from there. I always have to convert from moles of one substance to moles of another substance using the coefficients from a balanced chemical reaction.
check, 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 check.